I'm going to get a new wife. Gets on the internet and finds a new wife. And uh, she's up in Canada. And, and so dad can't talk him out. Nobody can talk him out. Everybody's livid with him. Nobody will talk to him. Nobody will deal with him. Um, we met um, in Palm Springs, I think, in conventions 20, 30 years ago. And we were good friends. We'd have him and his wife in our house. They, we'd change pulpits. We had tons of stuff together. And we went out behind a building and had a heart-to-heart. I was in my 30s, so it was more a fist-to-heart and push-around and that kind of stuff. But really was mad. I was just mad. And I thought, I don't want to ever talk to this guy again. All the damage, all the hurt, all the pain that he's done to all these people. And then, as I was praying, the Lord said, knock it off, punk. God, we have a real clear understanding, because he knows me better than I know myself. And he says, somebody has got to stand with him and love him back to life in Jesus Christ. Somebody, I think, oh, no, I'm glad you've got people for that. And the God said, no, it's going to be you. And so Patty and I made a commitment to continue to stay in contact, continue to to, to be friends. And it's amazing how cruel Christians can be. It is amazing how we are going to put chains right back on people. You blew it. You knew you blew it. You've blown it. Now we want nothing to do with you. The world will let you back in. You can get a divorce in the world. Hey, well, I understand, you know, 50% of marriages in a divorce. And they'll be your friends again. In the church, it's almost like you've got something wrong with you. You've got a disease. Man, that's just just not godly. That's, That's not grace. We're so interested in punishment. We forgot about restoration. We forgot what God's called us to. That's to restore those who have fallen. He's never gone back into ministry, but he's back to serving the Lord. And, and it's, those years were tumultuous years for him. And it, I remember just watching the church savagely go after him. I have another friend who is a pastor and a good friend of mine. Gave in to sin. Gave in to sin. Went and confessed. Wanted to be restored. That included four years in prison. A bunch of other stuff. Gets out. He's moved to another city. Goes into a church. Three of the churches said, uh, we can't stop you from coming here, but. Now, there's a welcoming restoration place. Forty-some churches in that city. Only one allows them to come. Gifted beyond belief. Gift. Ten times the pastor, preacher I am heart of gold and so is his wife grown children grandchildren but absolutely kept to the curb useless we can't stop you from coming here now this is heavy isn't it the problem is bible tells us we're to restore people not persecute them we're to come alongside and love them to life in jesus christ But we're so afraid so often of just being tainted by their sin or some sort of a shadow if we come alongside them. I say there's got to be people who come alongside people who've blown it, repented, and then just walk with them back to life. To me, it's, it's, it's so frustrating when I see, especially the second person, Unbelievably gifted, anointed. Why? 
he lost that anointing. Want to bet? Developed an entire system for prisoners in prison. Chaplain said, I'm not coming to here anymore. I don't need to come over here. You're doing a better job than I was. The recidivism rate on the prisoners that he was dealing with with his four years dropped down to less than 40%. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Developed a whole thing how the church needs to embrace people who failed, repented, and on their coming back. We need to restore people. But oh, no, no, no. We got to persecute them. We got to make sure they suffer. Okay, that you're saying, oh, no, we don't do it. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And that should not be so among us. The attitude for life is grace. Are we going to gracefully love people to life, or are we going to hold them to standards we can't even ourselves meet up to? Because if we all get our masks ripped off, we're all holding stuff. We're all hiding stuff. We need to be people who are in grace. We're living in a time right now where we, we've talked about the Rules for Radicals, the book that's um, de- it's dedicated to Lucifer. The, the initially the book says dedicated to Lucifer, the original radical. It's how to change your society. Blah 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 blah. We already talked about this. Um, Hillary Clinton wrote a 93-page thesis on him. Met with the author numerous times. Another president kept his book, really appreciated him. man died in 1972, and I'm sure he was with whoever he worshipped while he was on earth. But what we need to understand is we do not... See, Rule 2, 3, 3 says that you make them adhere to their own rules legalistically and point out if they don't. That's in the rules for radicals dedicated to Satan. The tragedy is that it's crept into the church. If somebody doesn't hold up to the rules, boy, we're... And then rule seven says, prioritize them, publicize it, isolate them. I'm saying this should not be so among us. We need to be open and honest enough to admit Look, I need somebody to pray with. I'm not saying you stand up and share your dirty laundry with everybody. But there's enough mature believers within this fellowship that we can begin to pray with one another and pray for one another and hold up one another. We can begin to hold each other to the point where restore in the spirit of gentleness. Attitude for life. Okay, he's on a tangent. I am so disappointed, not in this fellowship, not at all. I I see grace in this fellowship continuously. But I want us to really understand that we're to sow grace. For grace, we've been saved. It's not a work, it's not something we did. It's something Christ did for us. We've been called to liberty. And not only to, to use the liberty as an opportunity to flesh, no, don't do it that way. But serve one another in love. I was so amazed yesterday, and I, I, we'll, we're, we're going to talk about Galatians 6, 1, 2, and th- through that when I get to it. But I was so touched yesterday by watching, what, 25? I don't know how the guys will have to tell some of the guys we had, 25 or more. We had some guys come early. And they begin cooking and cleaning and doing setting up, taking down the tables. And, and after it was over, they put them back up again. By the way, ladies, there's no bacon grease. We cooked, what, eight pounds of bacon yesterday and 60 eggs and, and a huge bowl of this. And, 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 but here's the deal. We took all the tablecloths off the tables we cooked a hundred and some pancakes, lice and fluffy. We didn't get syrup anywhere. Thank you, Rick. 
for taking everything off Rick and Roger cooked, and then Rick put it all back together as Roger cleaned up. Each of you is to serve. Hours. That, the, the time they put in was a full day. And then there were others that went outside, tore down the tent, didn't tear it down, they took it down. <laughs> put everything away the way it should be put away. And then there were a couple of gentlemen who came back later in the heat of the day and spent the rest of the day taking down the baseball backstop. Serving one another, doing what you can. I was amazed. I went outside. I, I looked a couple of times and thought, what are you guys, sun too long? I mean, you guys already took down, did all that. Now they go out and get the tools and start taking down that. Not a small thing. You know, if we had had it done by somebody else, it might have cost us two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. These two gentlemen came on their own to do it. I'm amazed at the way that people within this fellowship serve. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Yes, yes, I want to thank you. For all the law is filled in one. One word, it's this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to walk in the Spirit, not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it goes on in, in the fifth chapter of Galatians. It's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit is love. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is not love and joy. No, no, fruit of the Spirit all comes out of love. All, we've, already, we've already been through a series on that. And you can look it up if you don't understand that. We get down here with gentleness, self-control. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let's not become conceited. I love that. Oh, what am I even thinking? There's nobody in this church who would ever become conceited. Might as well joist that word out of there. If you don't understand what I said by that, ask somebody and they'll tell you the story. I want to come to where I really feel that God's calling us this morning. The demonic realm is alive and well in the world today. Duh. Okay. Unfortunately, the devices of the enemy also work against the church, work against the believers. And I don't want us to be ignorant of the traps. I had somebody come in, why, why are you talking about that book? Why, why are you talking about how that's going to work? Because we have leaders in this nation who have done huge thesis papers after interviewing. We have people running in politics who absolutely quote, quote, time and time again, Stalin's 1936 constitution to the people of Russia. It's the exact quote. It has the exact same end. Now, that person has been doing this all along. All these, all these three other people I've talked about have been doing it. It's not, I'm not talking politics. I'm just talking principle. What are they talking about? Now, supposedly, she's changed her mind in a week. But they're out there. Because I don't want the church falling into the trap of tearing each other apart. I don't want us falling into the idea that the world can divide and destroy us. They can shame and isolate it. That's one of the things that Satan does against the church, Christians, so much. He uses shame. Oh, I can't, nobody can know. I've got to hide this. I've got to hide this. You know, long, long time ago, Why do things like that start a song in my head? Long, long time ago. Forget it. If you're, my, if you're my age, you'll know the song. Anyway, I remember thinking, oh, man, i got to hide this. And I had a really good older brother come to me, and we talked about it. And he was my confidant, and he says, you know what? You need to acknowledge it, and you need to walk on out of it. And I went, cool. And that's what I did. You know, nobody threw me overboard. They didn't hate me. I was dealing with some manner of temper. 
And I know none of you have ever had it. By the way, I've not completely won the victory yet. But I remember him saying, look, 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 don't try to hide that. You need to get accountability for that. You need to have somebody walk with you. And then you need to acknowledge it before you yelled at somebody in public. And I got up and confessed it. It felt so relieved because I didn't have to hide it anymore. I'm not saying we share our laundry out here, but I'm saying we all need to have people we can talk to. Brethren, if someone is overtaken in a trespass, overtaken. Oh, okay, I better back up on that one. All of us fall into traps once in a while. Amen? All of us miss the mark. And if you don't, let me check the mirror and put it under your nose so you're still living. Because we may not miss the mark from what the church would think is huge, but it's attitude towards others. Maybe it's something God has called us to, to do and we didn't do it. There's another one that ch churches really don't care for. To know to do right and not to do it to that person that is sin. That's not fair. It's the word of God. I want us to be people who are not divided and destroyed, shame or isolated. Make them live up to their own rules, that's rule four. And when they don't, isolate, polarize, and personalize, reject. I say it's time for the church to get back into the restoration business instead of the rejection business. Now, we got a sermon coming up that's called Truth Decay. Not Tooth Decay, Truth Decay. And we'll talk about the truth, and we'll talk about how to stand for truth. But right now, I want to talk to people, who, and I want to embrace people who've blown it, they know they've blown it, they've, been, they, they've overtaken in a trespass. They knew they blew it, they've repented. They need help, not rejection. They need restoration. Not somebody coming along and pointing it out to them. The Bible has a very clear path when it's leaders that fall. And by the way, what's one of the things that's really ticking me off about this? Eh, boy, I probably, is that part of my temper problem? Everybody knows a couple of major pastors um, have fallen in the last months. One of them, I have, both of them, I have a lot of their books. Gentlemen, check this out. This fall, we're starting our series on the kingdom and politics, written by one of the two gentlemen. And we're going to watch his videos. I don't know what his fall was. I don't know what it was all about, but I know he's withdrawn. But that does not mean, and I've watched and read the whole series, that what God had him do and present is not godly. See, often we think when a person blows it, everything they've done is blown. No, no. What was that guy's name? David, David, that was the guy's name. What did God say about it? Oh, a man after my own heart. Only person in Scripture God ever said it about David. Nice thing about David, he never blew it. <laughs> Takes another man's wife. The guy is one of the 33 greatest fighters, strongest men, faithfulest friends that David ever had. It's written right in the, the, the thing of 33. Takes his wife, gets her pregnant. Oh, I've got to bring him back from battle. I've got to have him sleep with her so, you know, I won't get caught. I've got to cover this thing up. The guy's got too much class, too much integrity. I'll sleep at the door. He doesn't even go in his own house. He sleeps on the doorstep. I can't, I can't go inside my house when my men are out to battle. Oh, come on. Get me out of this, will you? Okay. Take this letter to the general when you go back to battle. Anybody know what the letter says? I'm trying to cover myself up. I'm trying to protect it. I want you to put him right in the wall in a city you're attacking, and then everybody drop back from him and let them kill him. What happens? 
certain prophet comes and says, hey man, there's this guy that had uh, one little lamb. In fact, the lamb was so precious to him, they kept it in the house. Just one lamb. His neighbor had thousands of sheep, lamb. But he had a guest come to his house. And rather than going out and getting one of his own sheep, he stole his neighbor's sheep and killed it and served it to the neighbor. David jumps up off the phone going, throne going, kill him! You, sir, are that man. You know, we're going to try to hide it. How about we just get it out? Let God forgive us and move on in grace. And by the way, David wasn't kicked out of God's plan for life because he blew it. And neither are you, and neither is that person who's blown it, confessed it, and wants to be restored, but we've got to make them go through the steps. I'm not saying there's not a place for holiness, not a place for discipline and discipleship. I am saying there is a place in each of our hearts that has to be filled with grace. Brethren, if a person is overtaken, caught up in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. I want to tell you, and I want to tell you right now, though I've met numerous people in my life who believe they had the gift, there is no gift of criticalness or sin de or defining of sin. Oh, you know, I'm not sure. You, you got that sin. Sin detection is not a... A sin detector is no gift. But who? Ah, look at those people. I mean, we've all heard the stories when I grew up. Brother comes back, got hair down to his waist, 60, whatever it was. Early, middle 60s, hippie. Mom and dad praying like crazy. And then comes to church. I was in probably ninth grade, and he was a grown man, and he was so thin, he wore my clothes. But they were Sunday school clothes, you know, clothes I wore to some church. And the lady comes up behind him, yeah, you wouldn't let these hippies in here until they shave. Heads out back out the door a good ten years before he comes back to church. Let's not be that, okay? Let's be a people who want to restore. Let's be a people, if somebody's caught up in a sin, that we're willing to walk alongside of them. Let's be a people who have an attitude for life which is called grace. No gift of sin detector. If a person knows they're trapped in an area of sin in their lives, let's not go and poke at them. They'll let you know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I saw a thing this week where, ah, I'll say it anyway. Um, my wife's just struggling down. Don't, don't, don't say it. Don't. Lady says, you know, I get a call to go to my kid's house or something. And if I go by and there's three or four cars out there, I keep on going because it's private intervention. You know, there's so many of us who want to do things to intervene for other people. They have to want to be restored before we can restore them. That's big. But if we live a life of grace for other people, they're going to want to come to us when that happens. If we're a people known for grace and kindness and goodness and mercy, they'll come to us. But they're not going to come from us if they see us lopping off the heads of everybody who makes a mistake around us. I remember one time somebody said, AA, is un you don't need that. You don't need that. You just need to get saved and blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, no, no, no. There needs to be a place. You know, remember, it was started by Christians where people can come and have support and work together. You who are spiritual, restore just the one in a spirit of gentleness. It's interesting. What did Jesus do when Lazarus came out of the grave? Hey, Lazarus, I want you to start running. He's all wrapped up. 
It's the same thing. If we're going to restore somebody, we've got to unloose them. He's overtaken a trespass. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Loose him. Same concept, same place. Willing to acknowledge they're willing to be changed or repentantly gentle. We need to be a people of grace. Restore. Karazizo. All of you know that it's a medical term in one's fashion. It's the idea of, by the way, they didn't have, what's, what, what, what are casts made out of? Plaster Paris? What, what, I don't know. What, no, they didn't have that. They had to have somebody set it, hold it, splint it, and then wrap it. It had to be held. The whole concept here, willing to hold the arm until it heals. It's also the same word that's used in Matthew 21 when he said they were mending their nets. Now, for anybody who's ever commercial fished and used nets, and I have, mending the nets is a drag. It takes patience. It takes time. You can't get frustrated. You have to weave it in the right direction. You have to pull the thing tight. And if you get mad, because one side you got the needle that pulls it through, the other side's got a little knife on it. And I can tell you more than once, I sliced the net when I was splicing the other side of the net. Until finally they said, hey, 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 why don't you go over there and clean the decks? And we'll splice the net. It's amazing because when you get frustrated, because you're, you're trying to get the splice, the fish has gone through, it's an oversized salmon, and you've got to pull it through and you pop it, and, and, and so you can slice it and put it up. And, and I don't know, I was in my 30s or my late 20s when I was doing most of that, and I just didn't have the patience for it. I did get to clean the hold out of the slime and all that kind of stuff, but I'd rather do that than try to slice a net, splice a net. Uh, the same word. And Jesus came along and they were mending their nets. Patience, long time, no for frustration. That's grace, friends. That's grace. And I'll tell you what, I've had a lot of people, I told this, and I know I'm telling a lot of stories, but this is how it works in our life. Christians who have grace are remembered and they restore. I told you about how I... I we were young. We had a couple of kids. Our neighbors across the street were just wonderful people. They were about 8, 10 years older than we were. Um, country road. Happy hippie hillman. I don't know what else I can say. You know, they're just uh, wonderful, wonderful mature saints. They were, I guess we were in our 20s. They were in their 30s. And I had a rampage. They were over one night and I had a rampage about abortion. Just went off. Just went off. I just I can't believe it. I'm and, and Trish, that was her name, she said, Greg, and I wasn't pastor, and I was just working. Can I see you outside for a minute? And I went, okay. So we walked out in the yard. She's got tears in her eyes. And she says, you hurt me so badly. I'd, I'd, Fred and Dr I'd never done anything to hurt that couple. They were the greatest couple that's ever. How did I hurt you? I had two abortions before I came to Christ. And when you go off like that, it hurts. It really hurts. I'll tell you what. I walked back in the house. The door was still closed. I just walked underneath it. I was so low. I will never, ever forget that is a restorative answer. That is how you help people mature. It wasn't, listen, you dumbbell. It was, I was hurt. Somebody I truly cared about and loved. But I tell you what, we need those kind of people in the church. I was caught up in, and I'm not saying that, that, uh, that my whole attitude and presentation against abortion was wrong. It hurt other people. That wasn't the right way to do it. I'm so glad that she was willing to spend the time with me. Willing to humbly say that hurt. Can we do that with other people? 
Can we lovingly see people that are in bondage walk up and lovingly help them? With gentleness, charitos, kindness, quietness, grace. You don't announce to the world what you're doing. You simply go to that person in grace. I'd like everybody to stop now. I'm praying for this low-life puke over here who sinned deeply. And I'm going to list off all the stuff they've done. But hey, we'll get them back on the road. I can tell you a number of people I've known over my life who got hurt by the church and are still in the church. Anybody know anybody who got hurt by the church and never came back? Let not that be us. Let's love people life in Jesus Christ. Gentleness. Con- considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another bu- burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. By the way, Phillips does a great job. I don't have it in front of me, but Phillips is this. For if anyone thinks themselves to be something, that already proves they're nothing. They've already deceived themselves. Phillips does a great job on that one. I, I just want us to be a people of grace. I just, I, I feel bad for these ministers who have blown it. But I don't believe God's ripped away their anointing. I'm going to keep their books in my library. Gentlemen, we're going to watch one of them series on politics this fall. Because I believe God does not throw away people who repent. I believe God wants to restore. And I believe it's time for the church to have restoration that, rather than rejection. Amen? I want us to be a people who just love people to life. Because you know what the Bible says? This fulfills the law of Christ. This is what it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Amen? Is it hot in here or is it just me? Chuck, I can't hear me. Open the doors, would you? Just The reason it gets hot in here is that the temperature gauge for the thermostat for the air conditioner is in the hall. <laughs> so when we close the doors in here, and this guy starts jumping around a little bit, and it's not just me. All of you are in here, too. The temperature goes up. So I, I, I guess this whole thing with my life and my... Lord has been so gracious with me. He's been so good with me. The family of God has been so gentle with me. I want to be a family of God who's gentle with others. I don't want to persecute. I don't want to find a reason to hammer on somebody. I want to find a reason to help restore somebody. And I want to do with gentleness. And I want to do with kindness. I don't want the church divided. I don't agree, because here, here's the deal, folks. Here's the deal. We're coming to a, an, a point in our nation where there's going to be a lot of division, and there's going to be a lot going out there. Let's not get caught up in it. Don't shut down your neighbor because they disagree. Pray for them. See, I didn't say what I wanted to say, that little remark. No, don't say it now. They can be wrong, but we can pray for them. Amen? We're we're going to start a series on truth decay. And we're going to look at the Word of God. And we're we're going to look how it seems to be decaying away. But we need to brush up on it. Amen? Let's live in grace. Let's be people who restore people to life. Let's smile. Let's be gentle. It's not, but by the way, it's not easy. Especially if it's not your personality. 
Amen? But if we'll do it, people's lives will be changed. They'll come to us for prayer and help. And we can begin to mend them, restore them, because they know they aren't going to get sliced and diced. They're going to be loved to life. Amen? When they make a mistake, let's pick them up and help them. When I was in college, I played center, and I had a kid hit me so hard, he knocked me head over tail backwards. He had it just perfectly timed. And when, he, when I snapped the ball, he had already had a full head of steam and rolled me over. And I just, coach pulled me out and he goes, you know better than that. And I'm thinking, how do I stop that? And he told me, and he says, I'll get back in there. He didn't pull me out of the game because, oh, by the way, the guy sacked the quarterback. <laughs> okay, he caused a fumble, too, and got it. I looked like the biggest jerk on the world. I didn't get thrown out forever. I got told, hey, you can do better than that. And here's how you do better than that. And then practice the next week. Must have had 40 times. Let's hit him again. Let's hit him again. Let's see if he remembers what I taught him. But he stood with me and helped me. Oh, by the way, the guy that hit me, he went to the pros. He deserved it. He went to Denver. <laughs> but uh, I just remember so often in my life where I've gotten run over, bowled over, where I've fallen, people didn't reject me. They didn't, didn't feel it was their responsibility to begin to Show me how horrible I was. They restored me. And I'll tell you that a huge effect on my life. Every time when somebody lovingly will hold us accountable, lovingly restore us, I believe that's what God's called us. Let's bear one another's burdens and so fill the law of Christ. Amen? I want to encourage you in that. Just I know some of you have got people you're dealing with right now. Just release them to the Lord. Just give grace to him. It's hard, but you can do it through Jesus Christ. It's not you. It's him in you. Amen. I want to just encourage you. Grace, grace, grace.